So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for February 17, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of committee at her discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Um, otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? All right, thanks. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Holmes? Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Dr. Perrin-Josie? Dr. Elmendorf? Present. Mr. Conley? Present. Ms. Ferguson? Present. Ms. Cox, if could you check if there are any other members participating on the call that you have not named? Um, we have presenters, um, Dr. Woolridge? Present. Mr. Twenty? Present. Ms. Machinda? Present. Ms. Kraft. And and Dr. Wolf. So before I turn the meeting over to Dr. McComas's team, I want to thank everyone for your flexibility in meeting earlier today so that we could get through the materials that we need to get through. And Dr. McComas, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you decide, uh, since we do have a quorum, um, the order in which you would like to present the information. Sure, so what, since we do have a quorum, let's go ahead and go with the original order of the agenda. Um, so. Thank we'll, you, I agree. Yeah, okay. So our first um, order of business here, um, our materials of instruction that will um, be moving forward to our um, contracts committee um, around, is it March 8th, whatever the next contracts committee is. Um, and so our first item is Orton Gillingham, and I believe Dr. Karen Dozy is on the call. Um, I know she's not with that camera today. Um, are you with us, Dr. Karen Dozy? I am, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. So at this point, um, because of the um, number of items we have, I'm gonna turn it right over to, to Dr. Karen Dozy. Good afternoon, committee chair, committee members, Dr. Boswell, McComas, and colleagues. Today's item brought forth is a contract regarding our Orton Gillingham training and consultation contract. This contract is around the Orton Gillingham training methodology that is brought. It is our purpose for training educators on the methodology that supports our students with dyslexia in the tier two and tier three, both gen ed and students with IEPs. It supports them in their tier two and tier three. Uh, the purpose of this actual, the request today, is that is a five-year contract that is ending in June, but we do have one training left for approximately 30 participants. We are asking for an increased spending authority to complete that training. We do have the funding available. This contract is funded through our grant. Currently, the service details to complete this training, this five-year contract training at this time, was we have a number of educators that were impacted and trained, approximately 579 throughout our system with 159 schools being participating. And you can see that breakdown with 110 in elementary. We've expanded to middle school being 25 and 21 high schools having trained staff throughout the system right now. And so we'd like to close out this five-year contract with this last, asking for an increased spending authority. 
Now, not this, this particular bit of information is not for this contract or this request, but we did want you all to know that we um, do have this contract again coming. You'll see it in the future. It is out for RFI. Uh, that's just an extra note of information not having to do with this particular request. Thank you for hearing this out at this time. Mr. Offerman, do you have any questions? No, not at this time. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey, you're muted if you're speaking. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Pirandozzi, um, for bringing that forward, and Dr. McComas for opening the meeting. Um, so 110 elementary schools, that's all of them. Is that correct? OK, and um, Campfield Early Learning Center is a standalone um, pre-K. Uh, was any training done at that level? I will have to check for you um, specifically. We do have training, and sometimes as we train educators, they do move. So specifically, the trained individuals at sites, I would have to go back and verify at this particular time, but we can do that. Okay, thank you, because we know this is uh, very successful, especially the earlier um, that it's implemented. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. I, I do have a question, Dr. Perandozzi. Um, it's my understanding that Orton Gillingham is 60 hours of training, and um, I have been told by many teachers that they have not received the training. Or for this request, will this 30 participants ensure yes. How many teachers? Training these 30 participants three? ensure that every teacher who is providing a tier two or a tier three intervention be fully trained to 60 hours on OG. I'm sorry, can you repeat the I, I did hear again? some. So um, Dr. McComas and I have spoken many times. I am concerned that we have not fully trained our staff, the staff that who provide tier two and tier three interventions on all of the tools that we have purchased that would help make students successful. I know because I've talked to many teachers that Orton Gillingham is a 60 hour course. And my question specifically is, with this request of training 30 participants, will this ensure that every educator who is providing a tier two, tier three support be fully trained in Orton Gillingham? So Orton Gillingham is not one. It is not the only intervention for students and it's not for every student, right? So depends on the specific needs of individuals. And based on that, if it is a identified tier two or tier three, we address that for students and teachers based on needs. So when a teacher signs up and, and sections are open, those Teachers that are registered for that do participate and complete that training in the, the days and the 30 participants will complete those trainings if that's the question that you are asking. And they will complete all 60 hours? Yes, they do. Okay, and anybody who provides tier Hi. two and tier three support will be covered. Yeah. Should they require those that yes. participate or sign up and register, we do complete that for them, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Absolutely. Mr. Offerman or Ms. Causey, do I have a motion to approve um, this request? So moved, Offerman. Do I have a second? Second, Ms. Causey. May I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. McComas. Okay, oh, thank Mr. you. Mr. Um, Thomas joined us. Yeah, welcome. Um, thank you everyone for uh, your support of Orton Gillingham as a intervention resource for uh, our children and our teachers. Um, our next um, item for consideration here is our AVID Center program, in which case I have Dr. Wistead and Dr. Woolridge uh, to, to share with us what this is, why we um, are bringing it forward, um, and they'll be available to answer your questions, of course. Go ahead, Dr. Wistead. 
Um, sure. Oh, I see Dr. Wilders is here with us as well. So um, AVID advancement via individual determination, as you know, is not a new thing with Baltimore County Public Schools, but we, um, in March you will be seeing the contract coming forward for a renewal. So Dr. Wilders is here just to give you some content details about AVID. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Next slide, please. Baltimore County Public Schools College and Career Readiness Programs align with our strategic plan, the COMPASS, our pathway to excellence in the learning, accountability, and results section. Our goal is simple, preparing each child to graduate ready to enter their chosen career, career training, military training, or credit-bearing college-level coursework. Our work is to provide the necessary supports that will deliver on this promise. Next slide, please. One way we deliver on our promise is by partnering with AVID Center. AVID is a college readiness system in K through 12 schools with a mission to close the opportunity gap by preparing all students for college readiness and success in a global society. This directly aligns with BCPS's vision of raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing for our future. Next slide, please. Avid Elementary teaches and reinforces academic behaviors and higher level thinking to students at a young age. Elementary students develop the academic habits they will need to be successful in middle school, high school, and college and beyond in an age appropriate and challenging way. Children learn about organization, study skills, communication, and self-advocacy. Avid Elementary students take structured notes, ask and answer high level questions that go beyond routine answers. The strong college going culture in an Abbott Elementary campus encourages students to think about their college and career plans. Schools cover their walls with college pennants and banners. Educators speak about their college experiences and their career aspirations. College and careers are no longer foreign concepts in our elementary students, and teachers provide the academic foundation students need to be on a path for college and career success. Avid Elementary closes the oppor opportunity gap before it ever begins. Next slide, please. The power of Avid on the secondary level is the ability to impact students in the Avid elective class and all students throughout the campus. The AVID elective is available to students in grades 6 through 12 who possess a desire to go to college and the willingness to work hard, but who may face barriers in becoming college ready. These are often the students who will be the first in their families to attend college or who may be from subgroups traditionally underrepresented in higher education. For one period a day, students in the AVID elective class receive the ac uh, excuse me, additional academic, social, and emotional support that will help them succeed in their school's most rigorous courses. AVID secondary can have an effect on the entire school by providing classroom activities, teaching practices, and academ academic behaviors that are incorporated into any classroom to improve engagement and success for all students. AVID secondary equips teachers with and schools with what they need to help all students succeed on a path to college and career success. Next slide, please. BCPS joined the AVID family in 2002, and so that means July 1st marks our 20th anniversary as an AVID district. Woo! We have grown from six sites to 56 sites that are currently imp implementing the AVID school-wide college readiness system. We have 11 elementary schools, 24 middle schools, and all we have AVID in all 22 of our comprehensive high schools. All sites are AVID center certified and implement AVID with fidelity. This school year, AVID is serving over 7,000 students through the AVID elective class in grades 6 through 12 and in the classrooms of AVID trained elementary school teachers. BCPS AVID students have lower suspension rates, higher attendance rates, higher GPAs, and a greater likelihood of com completing the Maryland University system requirements for college entrance than students not participating in the AVID elective. The BCPS AVID class of 2021 was our largest graduating class ever with 570 graduating AVID scholars who earned a combined total of more than $36 million in scholarships and grant activities. Next slide, please. 
In addition to providing direct support to students in K through 12, our AVID membership provides resources that drive school transformation and hands down the best professional learning for educators. AVID offers a variety of classroom activities, lesson plans, professional learning videos, and timely articles that are relevant to students. These tools help educators implement and refine their instructional practices. They also help educators provide the key academic and social supports students need to thrive. Schools can utilize the professional learning modules and materials for in-service training and can access all of these resources year round. AVID's professional learning benefits both beginning and experienced educators. Here, educators reevaluate re their beliefs and expectations around student potential and learn and practice activities that transform classrooms and campuses. Trainings cover all core content areas and all grade levels in, to in topics such as culturally relevant teaching, academic language and literacy, and digital teaching and learning. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we humbly ask you to renew our contract with AVID Center for another five years. We wish to continue to expand our AVID Elementary program and to reinforce our AVID Secondary program. We ask to continue to utilize the resources and professional learning that are a part of our AVID Center membership to help BCPS close opportunity gaps and prepare students for future success. Thank you. Final slide, please. Any questions? Looks like Mr. Offerman will start us off with questions. Yes, uh, what, is it, uh, what is the process for a school to become a center for AVID? Thank you for that question. Um, <clears throat> when we are allowed to expand, we uh, provide information sessions that are required that are um, required to be attended by a principal and they are invited to bring um, members of their leadership team. This information session um, gives them a thorough, avid, actually avidizes them. It's an interactive um, session that demonstrates AVID, um, but also gives them all the information they need to make a decision about whether or not they want to commit to becoming an AVID school. We then have an application process. A committee is put together that uh, evaluates the uh, applications and, um, and then chooses who gets to become an AVID Center based on the number of slots we are allocated for that particular year. Thank you. Uh, what, are there any specific qualifications to become the person who teaches the actual AVID class? Yes, we ask that they become AVID Center trained and they can do that in a variety of ways. Uh, they can become AVID Center trained by attending one of the annual summer institutes, which is a two to three day uh, training that AVID Center is actually hosting in Baltimore for the first time this summer. We are thrilled. Woo -woo! Thank you, Dr. McComas, for advocating for on our behalf. <laughs> um, and or if they uh, attend that, they become AVID Center trained and there are specific strands based on what they'll be teaching. So if they're an AVID elective uh, teacher on the secondary level, they would go to a middle school one if they're a middle school teacher or a high school um, course if they're high school. If they're going to be an AVID elementary teacher, they would take AVID elementary foundations. Um, and then there are other trainings for non AVID elective teachers uh, for in core four, in CTE, etc. Et uh, Thank you. Yep. If a teacher is unable to attend during the summer, um, our district leadership, AVID district leadership team is um, qualified to provide what we call AVID professional learning workshops and teachers that attend six of those workshops, they're two hours each, so 12 hours of training overall, they also can become AVID center trained. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Causey. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Bullridge, and thank you for that. Very enthusiastic presentation. I am with you 100%. Um, I've been on the board since 2015 and just have seen uh, the impact, the positive impact of AVID, and not just in the positive numbers, but in the individual students that I've met at graduations and other places um, that were just so thrilled to have that opportunity. Thank you. Um, coming as I do um, from Buildings and Contracts Committee for many years, I always am uh, wondering about the amounts. And I understand that in Curriculum Committee, the uh, primary is to understand the uh, achievement, the academic achievement impact um, on the recommendations that you're bringing, but also um, I think it's important to understand 
the uh, fiscal impact because this would be the place to discuss, are we asking for enough? Um, you know, how is this going to roll out? When are we going to look for that positive feedback report on, on um, the investment um, that the school system is making in this product? So um, I'm just curious, what is the amount and is it the same as uh, previous years? Great, thank you for that question. Um, I we are I, asking for. Oh, sorry, I have, Dr. I have I do have the amount, um, but just to share with you, the um, the amount is to sustain the numbers of schools that we have at this time. Um, at, right, Heather, that's correct. It's 2.5 million that will be coming through, and that's not to grow any additional schools. If that's what the question is. And could you, Doctor, um, or either either of our doctors, uh, relate to this uh, AVID program? Ha that I know, um, as you were saying, that sustains where we currently have it. How many total schools is that? Because I know we talked about the elementary, the middle, the high. Um, just to give everyone sort of like this amount of money, this number of schools, and that's uh, requesting for five over five years, right? So just to give a yep. sense of how that breaks down. It's, so that's 56 sites, mm -hmm. 56 sites for five years. Ms. Fozzi, do you have any other questions? So yes, so if you're sustaining the amount and the number of sites, um, so can additional students still join um, the, the programs that are already in the schools? And does that mean that for just this year we're not expanding, but in the future we could look to expand? I will just jump right out there. We could look to expand in, in the future moving forward. Um, at this point, we def we are looking to sustain what we have. We certainly don't want to roll back anything. Uh, but absolutely, Ms. Causey, we could certainly be poised to expand. Um, I know Dr. Woolridge will not be satisfied until it is in every BCPS <laughs> school. Um, and I, I can't fault her for her commitment around it. But then I'll turn it over to the team to get back because um, I, as you could see on our chart, um, even though we, we really have maxed out really at our middle schools, every middle school has it, all but our three um, comprehensive magnets high schools have it. Um, and you could see our numbers of student participation continue to grow. I think we're in a 7,000 now. So I'll let Dr. Woolridge kind of talk about how that um, that pricing isn't per student. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, one of the benefits of the AVID Center membership is it is site based. So the more teachers we are trained that are trained in the elementary school, the more students will uh, elementary students will have um, access to the methodologies and wickerized lessons. Um, and then on the high school level, uh, more and more of our principals are dedicating more and more of their uh, FTE allocations to provide additional um, elective courses. And of course, um, AVID on the secondary level is a school wide uh, initiative, and so every student in those schools have access to the methodologies and wickerized lesson plans. Mr. Thomas, did you have any questions? Ms. Kazi, you were oh. on mute. I think yeah. Ms. Oh, Kazi was, was on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we were just in a meeting yesterday. And I wondered, this is all coming from curriculum and instruction. None of it is coming from Title I. Is that correct? That's correct. OK, thank you. Yeah, the only support that we have with um, from the Office of Title I is there is a central resource teacher in Heather's office that's paid for out of Title I. So that's that's the only funding that comes through Title I. And because then they serve directly in the Title I schools that have AVID. Correct. Right. Providing that extra support. Yes, that extra scoop, as we, we say. Call it, yep. Awesome. Okay. Scoop. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So, uh, does every student have access to taking an, an AVID elective course? Is that what was just stated? So, Mr. Thomas, uh, the schools that have AVID uh, are members of AVID. So, the you know, one of our 56 sites, they have the opportunity to apply to enroll in an AVID elective class, and our goal is to retain them in AVID. So our goal is always to start them as young as possible and keep them each year. So AVID is not really an elective that you would take one time. It's more like if you're really into music and you want to be in the chorus every year, you take chorus every year. And so we want them to be in AVID 9, 10, 11, 12. 
OK, so let's say that there was a sophomore in school who was interested in joining AVID, but didn't join as a ninth grade student. Would they, they could still apply to join the AVID program, but Absolutely. it's just not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. We also take juniors. We just don't take okay. seniors in their final year. Um, uh, I shouldn't say we don't. On rare occasions, we take seniors, uh, but usually that, you know, we are absolutely open to those juniors because that's the year that, you know, you're prepping for your applications and and you need, you know, you were doing all the college visits and, and really yeah. helping. Thank you for that's asking. So true. Thank you. Um, so you said that the three comprehensive magnet high schools were included. Is that Eastern Tech, Western Tech and Carver? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. And why aren't we expanding this year? Uh, why are we sticking to 56 schools and not trying to increase 57, 58 um, to, to expand to some of our elementary schools since we've already covered all the middle school and high schools? Yeah, so I will I will go ahead and take that and then I'll let the team add. You know, I, and Mr. Thomas, I think one, first let me just say our comprehensive magnet high schools where we don't have it, you know, they have high yeah. uh, levels of, of college admission and and all of that which is the origin of really this program is to support that first generation uh college student right in the process because they may not have uh, family members who are experienced in that process um we are not as you as we said we have it at every other high school we have it at every middle school and so the room that's left for expansion really would be our elementary schools at this time we're really looking um to see the impact uh that we have at the elementary schools where we have it so it kind of gets back to that really um, looking to see is it having you know what is the the depth of impact at the elementary school before we take uh, you know another financial step to expand it we're not opposed to expanding but at this point given everything uh, that we're working through as a whole school system right now we're really looking at at that um, before we take that next step so I'll leave it to the team if you have anything else to add to that OK, and which of our elementary schools currently have the AVID program? OK, I have that list pulled up because I have a feeling <laughs> that question was going to come up. Um, OK, so our AVID elementary schools are Chadwick Elementary, Deer Park Elementary, Grange Elementary, Holabird, um, the elementary, STEM Elementary, Lutherville Lab, Martin Boulevard Elementary, McCormick Elementary, Newtown Elementary, Pine Grove Elementary, Sandy Plains Elementary, and Villa Cresta Elementary. Okay, and was there some type of strategic planning as to why those certain schools have, have the AVID program and why other elementary schools don't? So um, as Heather explained before, they went through an application pro process. So yes, we did have more than those schools interested in it um, and so the the team that reviewed the applications um, you know had this criteria and you know those determinations were made as to those schools we attempted to have like a balance of schools around the system you know different criteria that was looked at okay thank you so much and i'm so excited sure. that we're reaching the 20 year mark <laughs> and i'm just going to take one minute to say what i always say when we talk about avid uh for many many years i've represented a child in the foster care system as a court appointed special advocate and the only thing she ever said positively about education was avid she talked about it all the time whenever she and i would meet so it does have an impact on students um thank you do i have a motion to approve this so move thomas do i have a second second, second Cosi. May I have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offer Offerman? Sorry. Yes. Ms. Cozzi? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank Dr. McComas, if you want to move to your next item. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, our next item for consideration um, is labeled as Materials of Instruction Discount Program. And I, uh, Ms. Shea uh, will speak to this. Um, Dr. McComas, I think you may have skipped one if we're going oh, here. Oh, oh, yes. Thank you. I think we're up Sorry. still. Yes, yep. thank you for correcting Ms. me. Ms. Stansberry. Yes, Ms. Stansberry is up. Uh, programs for students who are experiencing, summer programs for students who are experiencing homelessness. So take it away, Ms. Stansberry. Thank you. Yes, and this is, before Michelle starts, this is um, also something you'll be seeing as a contract. Um, and it is not something that is new. It, it is a partnership that we've had. Um, for several years, at, um, so this is a renewal as well. So go ahead, Ms. Sansbury. 
Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we saw that the New Horizons program is connected to our BCPS campus in every way possible. Um, next slide, please. What is most um, important is the fact that this program is available to students who are experiencing homelessness in high school, and it gives them an opportunity to really work on their own personal growth, career development, and build their leadership capacity. Um, this is a partnership, not just with Baltimore County and the Y of Central Maryland, but also with Baltimore County government. Baltimore County government actually pays students a stipend for working in the program after the students have completed their coursework for the day or for the week or for the month in that program. They have coaches and mentors that support them while they're working out in the field. And as you'll see in a couple of slides, um, we have several community partners who have hired our students to work over the summer and have actually continued to hire those students into the school year for after school work. Next slide, please. So AVID as it was, AVID, and I'm sorry, I'm saying AVID, look at me, boom, so sorry. New Horizons, Heather has just come over me. New Horizons as it was, and New Horizons as it has been, and New Horizons as it will be is very um, unpredictable. So what we've done is created a delivery model that is effective for face-to-face, -face, for hybrid, and for virtual. Um, we wanted to make sure that during the virtual learning phase, we did not lose track of the supports needed for our students experiencing homelessness. And over the past five years, we've had so many students participate in this program and come back to us and tell us that this really had an impact on them over time beyond their time in Baltimore County. So um, we just wanted to make sure it was very clear that this is a flexible program. We have found a way to make it work regardless to what the delivery method will be. The most ideal method is face-to-face, -face, um, but if we need to change to something else, we have been flexible to do that. It is a six to eight week program. Students be, work five days a week in the program. It starts in June at the end of the school year and goes through the middle of August. The very first week of the program, students are learning life skills, college and career development skills, leadership capacity skills, and some students enroll in our EYLP program and complete EYLP coursework. So they'll do credit recovery or um, they'll complete some credit classes during the summer to avoid taking those classes during the school year. In the afternoon, in some instances, students work in a paid internship. When EYLP is in session, which is four of the six weeks, students are working in the afternoons. And then when EYLP has ended, students are working full days and their mentors come to their work sites. Next slide, please. This is a continuation of a, a contract. We have worked with New Horizons for seven, New Horizons 2 for seven years. We've collected evaluation data at the end of every year, and we continue to build and grow our partnership opportunities. Next slide. Here's a little bit about the outcome of the program evaluation. There was an improvement in emotional and social and development skills, as well as students reported that they felt a lot more prepared to sustain and obtain employment. The majority of the employers reported their willingness to hire our students again and have continued to hire students into the school year. And we are looking at expanding participation across the county. Right now, we advertise um, pretty rigorously through our PPWs and through Baltimore County government. And we are looking at amping up that advertising so that more students are aware of this opportunity. Next slide, please. What you see listed here are a couple of our internship partners. Again, um, all of our partners really enjoyed working with our students and many of our students are continuing to work with these partners as after school employment. Next slide. We thought it was important for you to have a couple of student testimonies. What you will see recursively throughout these testimonies is the fact that students really enjoyed their participation 
in the program. They really felt as though it provided them some level of growth that they um, needed over the summer. And, and one of the things I think we all have realized over time is that um, the pandemic has resulted in students feeling very isolated and alone, and this took that isolation away, that feeling of isolation away from some of our students because they felt really connected to, um, to others that are there to support them. Next slide. Question. I think I'm going to start off with a question. Is there a definition of homelessness that you use? And the reason that I'm asking is uh, two streets from my house is a children's home. Um, and many of the students at a local high school go there. And I'm wondering, ob obviously they have a roof over their house, um, but it is transitional living for some of those students. Would they be included in this program? So um, it really depends the the definition for homelessness is very different um, when we look at McKinney Vento, the McKinney Vento statue and how we define that um, in Baltimore County and well for Baltimore County government. And so the way that we determine homelessness is really based on does a student have a regular daily sustainable um, place to 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 live? We say nighttime resident nighttime residents. Um, every day. And if they do, um, is that nighttime resident permanent residence permanent or is it temporary? Sometimes students are identified as experiencing homelessness because they're couch surfing. So those would be considered unaccompanied youth. They may be staying with a friend one day here and another friend one day there, but there is no consistent long term plan for that student to stay at that location. So if there is a long-term plan in place, it is not considered experiencing homelessness. It could be considered part of foster care, but not homelessness. So just one quick follow-up to that. Mm -hmm. Because, and I I've work a lot with kids, I actually just became a foster licensed foster parent. Um, because sometimes beyond the kid's fault there is a they move from couch to couch right. in and out of areas do right. we follow up with them do we provide transportation do we have a constant contact with them so that even though where they may be staying that night is disruptive there is some continuity with this program absolutely we do um, we have a homeless hotline and that homeless hotline is answered 24 hours a day our homeless liaison is very connected, especially to those students that you're describing. Um, if they go to different residents and they're moving around from one county to another, we keep them here in Baltimore County and provide them with the transportation they need. We have recently really amped up our cab service. Um, to really take a, a deeper look at how quickly are we getting students experiencing homelessness to their school so that they feel as though they can engage in extracurricular activities Good. or before and after school programs, all of those options. So we do stay very connected and the PPWs do an amazing job of making sure that they keep track of where kids are and what supports they need. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. Board members, are there any other questions? Mr. Thomas, I'm sorry if you put it in the chat. I didn't see it. Go ahead. No worries. Thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, so you said this program has been around for seven years, correct? Correct. Yes. So how many students on average do we have per year? I know last year and the year before are probably very different. Yeah, if I were to average it out across the past seven years, last year and the year before were when we took our, our, big, our biggest hits. Mostly yeah. we have anywhere between 40 to 50 students. Sometimes we have a little bit less than that. Mm -hmm. um, the the really highlight of that data point is the retention rate. So students may start but not continue. Our retention rate, regardless to how many students have been enrolled, is has been in the 90% for the past nice. seven years. Thank you. And so I was going back to the conversation about transportation. So for students to go to and from those internships that are offered yeah. as well, is there transportation provided for that as yes. well? Yes, we provide them with bus cards and if they lose those bus cards, we give them temporary tokens, bus tokens, and then until we're able to replace those bus cards. The bus cards is something we probably started about two, maybe three years ago, right before um, the world shut down. 
That's incredible. And uh, for the internships, how much are students being paid? Is it, does it range based on what the each company is suggesting, or is there like a BCPS kind of mandate with yeah. that? Baltimore County pays the minimum wage. Baltimore County government is the one that actually pays them and they pay them a minimum wage rate. We usually meet with Baltimore County government, the Y of Central Maryland and BCPS. We kind of come together to have some conversations about um, whether or not the pay rate is reasonable, whether or not it's something students um, would be willing to work for, or is it competitive? And we make a collective decision about that. Um, it's all really based on funding, but what we have found is that even if they're making um, a minimum wage rate with Baltimore County government, when they get hired at the end of the program by that by the company, they would make potentially a higher rate depending on what that company pays employees for that service. Thank you. And you said that it was open to high school students. Is this ninth through tenth, ninth through twelfth grade, or ninth through twelfth grade? Okay. Thank you so much. Ms. Causey. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Ms. Sansbury. Um, and this is a wonderful program. Uh, just in terms of the continuation and again, thinking about expansion in the future, uh, Baltimore County government pays the minimum wage um, to the students. And then do they also the co cover the transportation? We continue to cover the transportation for those students. Some of them are in our um, EYLP program and so they have to be able to get to their summer program in the morning and then their internship in the afternoon. So we make sure we provide them with the transportation service. Okay, and then there's probably just small some small amount of um, the board's operating budget that goes to um, the employees that are interacting with the students. It's like the PPWs. Paid for out of the, the partnership is paid for out of the grant. Isn't that oh, accurate? Yeah. Michelle, yep. so we use the McKinney Vento grant. Yep, the okay. partnership is paid out of McKinney Vento. Yep. Okay. Great. Mr. Offerman, did you have thank any you. questions? No, 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 I'm fine, thanks. Okay, um, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, it a, sounds like a wonderful program and I'm happy that it exists for our students. Uh, Dr. McComas, it looks like next up is Materials of Instruction Discount Program. Yes, and um, Ms. Mack, if you could go back and um, call, I think we need oh, an approval. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. May I have yes. a motion? <laughs> and if you could identify, just for the record, what it is that we're voting to approve, that way I'll be. Yes, may I have a motion to approve summer program for homeless high school students? So move, Thomas. Thank Second you, Mr. Offerman. Thomas. Second, Mr. Offerman. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, again. And so uh, with no further delay, I'll ask Ms. Shea um, to come forward. She has uh, three items that we'll be talking about. Um, our next one is Materials of Instruction Discount Program, and this is really um, for schools. These are materials for schools, but somebody needs to be the face to present uh, <laughs> this uh, work for uh, our school. So, Ms. Shea, if you'll go ahead and take it away. I've never been called the face. I'm the shepherd, I think, <laughs> for this one. Um, but yeah, so this is an example of how, um, as part of our procurement process, as Dr. McComas said, um, this is a contract that is mostly spent by schools with their operating budgets at schools. Um, it allows for the ongoing purchase of supplemental instructional materials. So this is not any of our core curricular resources, but rather everything else that you would see in a classroom. So art supplies, everything from pipe cleaners and googly eyes to paper cutters and scissors. Um, could be anything schools use for their centers, um, mini whiteboards, manipulatives, chart paper and sentence strips for teachers. Um, there is an opportunity. Some of the vendors that are on this contract are for books for classroom libraries, um, as well as classroom furniture. So storage bins, bookcases, easels, things like that. Um, so we do have some central office um, spend against this, um, including like the Office of Early Childhood um, and some of the other curricular offices, but the vast majority is used by schools. And including a big one right now is the new Northeast Elementary School. Ross, I believe it was official Ross Bell Elementary School. Um, and so our team is working to support Principal Jennings and his team as they get um, ready to start up. So um, this is a contract we've brought before, but this is um, a renewal because the current contract is expiring. 
Um, and so it's a wide range. It's a huge spreadsheet of all the different things that schools can purchase. Um, but by being a part of this contract, it does allow them to get that negotiated price, which is why it's called Materials for Instructional Discount um, Program, because the Office of Purchasing is able to negotiate better um, pricing for these vendors for that purpose. That's it. Mr. Thomas, it looks like you had a question. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Um, sure. So you said that most of the that this comes out of school based operating budgets, uh, right. but there are some central office fees as well, and that would come out of the board's operating budget. Is that correct? Correct. So that would be in our maintenance of effort budgets in the office. Yep. OK, thank you so much. You, you will also when it comes to contracts, you will see where it um, talks about the procurement um, source. Um, you'll also see capital funding listed, and that's because of startup costs. So when we talk about opening a school, um, that particular one might use that source as well. So it is a contract that can be used in a variety of ways. OK, thank you so much. Sure. So I have a quick question. Um, sure. I talk to teachers all the time, and I know that most teachers the last week of the summer spend two to three hundred dollars of their own money purchasing supplies sure. and it must be a widespread thing because it's a tax deduction from the irs right so if we are if we have this huge contract and we are providing all of this stuff why are our teachers spending hundreds of dollars out of their own pocket on these items my short answer is because they're teachers and and I say that not to be flip, but because um, and I will share with you from my own experience. My principal would provide me bins if I needed bins, but if I wanted rainbow colored bins with the students names on little frogs because I wanted to Velcro and I had a theme for my classroom, I would add those things myself. So I just use that as an example. Teachers do spend far too much of their money, um, but most of the time it's because they're trying to personalize or do things to go beyond, above and beyond for their students because that's what teachers teachers do. Um, in many instances, PTAs will offer teachers like a certain budget or will let teachers make a wish list. Um, in some instances, principals will say to teachers, especially around now because they're um, trying to make sure the budget lasts in case of any emergencies, sometimes principals right around now will start to say to teachers what's on your wish list for next year. Um, but that being said, I don't think that would ever eliminate teachers um, spending their own money because that's what teachers do. Hopefully this will reduce that. It should never be that teachers are buying core supplies, right? No teacher in Baltimore County should say, I won't have pencils unless I buy them myself. Um, but there may be teachers who want smelly pencils with hearts on it for Valentine's Day and, and want it to, to match the theme. Um, and so that's what I mean by them going above and beyond. I am on a Facebook site called Buy Nothing Catonsville, and there is a teacher. The minute somebody offers up colored pencils, <laughs> yes. um, markers, um, manipulatives, she says, "I may I please be considered for my classroom? Yep. And that's really what's in the back of my head, that she's literally begging people the minute one of those things hits the site for this information. So do we, do teachers know that this, this is a contract and that this information and these items are available to them. I would say yes. I mean, my my goal is always whenever you ask me something like that, I'm sure there's a teacher who will email you after and say I didn't right because there's thousands of them. So it would be my hope that teachers um, every school I've ever been in has a supply closet. Schools handle it differently um, how they distribute that. So every teacher should have what he she or they need to run their class. Um, but some of what you're talking about, too, is a lot of teachers provide those as prizes for students, incentives. They might um, provide extra bins of different uh, supplies when they're doing projects so that students have extra sets they can take home, especially if they're talking to students who don't have their own. Um, so again, every teacher, and I hope you would help support us spread that word, no teacher should say, I can't teach tomorrow without materials because that's what this contract is designed to do. Um, but I still think teachers are always going to be looking for, for ways to supplement because they're teachers. So do their husbands and their moms and their cousins and their neighbors. That's just what we oh, do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would also just encourage if you have teachers, ask, encourage them. Have you asked your principal, principal to support right. this, right? Because I think there is a long-standing culture within the profession of education that resources are limited, right? And so I think I know that as a principal, there were times teachers came to me and said, could we get? And I was like, yes, we can. We can use uh, either my funds or the Title I funds. You know, so sometimes teachers, I would always, always encourage them ask the principal 
the see if the principal can support that. And then if the principal is not able to for whatever reason, uh, then consider some of these other resources. But we agree we want teachers to spend less of their own money and more of their taxpayer dollars on our children. But uh, we also know teachers love to have rich and robust uh, classroom environments. So uh, and that can be uh, endless in some ways. So thank you. Thank you both. Um, sure. May I have a motion to approve materials of instruction discount program, please? So moved, Offerman. Matt, second. Is there a second? Uh, second, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Ms. Causey had a question. She had her. her oh, her, I, I'm her. sorry, I didn't see that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Causey. Thank you. So I just did a quick look on my other laptop through board docs, and I didn't see ARA-203-22. So is that a new um, vendor, a new contract? It's going to be replacing um, LKO. I can find the number for you. It's replacing a contract um, that already exists. Let me, if you give me one second, I can look up that number. Um, it'll be coming on March 8th. Um, it's actually going to be uh, cooperative with Anne Arundel. I believe the one it's replacing is LKO 460, but let me get you the exact number. I can put it in the chat or circle back. OK, thank you. And you should sure. probably say it aloud just so it's sure. Sure, heard. I'll look it up. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Uh, Mr. Thomas, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I thought there were no questions. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just wanted to say that um, speaking of, of supplies, I recently visited the Education Foundation's Exchangery uh, where they have shelves and, and bins and bins and bins of supplies for teachers. And just for any teachers that are watching and for any board members who maybe want to visit the Exchangery, please do. Please spread the word because um, Ms. Phelps, uh, the executive director of the Education Foundation and everyone involved has done an incredible job to get some resources for teachers, you know, as we're as they're running out during the school year. So. As Thank you. That's a very valid point. I attended the opening of the White Marsh Center last year or maybe two years ago. Who knows? I'm sorry. <laughs> do you have it, Miss Shay? Yes, I have one. I believe there's two, but one is definitely JMI 62517. And then I'm going to see if I can find the other one. And I know that will definitely LKO 40520. <laughs> and I know that'll definitely be a part of the contracts committee, of course. OK. So I have a um, motion and a second. Um, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Rothman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you, everyone. And it looks like the next item is elementary visual arts textbooks. Yes, uh, this is me again, Dr. McComas. Did you want to say anything before I roll right yeah. in? Just ready to keep moving. <laughs> All right, so um, I did want to take an opportunity. I'm joined today by Mr. Twenty. Mr. Twenty was um, promoted this year to coordinator of visual arts. So some of you, this may be your first time meeting Mr. Twenty, and I always invite um, our coordinators so that they get the opportunity to meet board members in a smaller setting, and you have an opportunity to meet them. So um, Mr. Twenty has been our supervisor and was also one of our phenomenal arts teachers in Baltimore County. So he's not new to the system, but new to this position. Um, and so, um, Mr. Corns, can you go? I'm may have put the slides in the wrong order. Can you go one more slide to the visual? Thank you so much. Um, so this is a new um, contract that will be coming forward for an elementary visual arts textbook. Um, and this is going to provide for a multi-year implementation. So we are not going to be hitting every elementary grade at once. Um, our goal is that um, we will be starting with, I believe, fifth grade. And the purchase will include a blend. As you know, we're um, often looking to have a blend of materials that will include digital and print textbooks. So class sense of print textbooks with digital access for every student. And the access includes, um, in addition to actually a replica of the print materials, it's curated an enormous library of art, of art access for students to be able to see images, um, as well as resources for differentiation for our multilingual learners and adaptive art, when we think about multiple ways of serving our students receiving special education, um, and also allows for our visual arts core resource to be aligned to the National Core Arts Standards, which were revised a few years ago. Um, the last time we purchased elementary visual arts textbook was in 2008, um, prior to the revision of the those um, National Core Art Standards, so this is definitely a, a timely resource. 
Um, and because I know that um, Ms. Causey and Ms. Mack will um, ask, um, we did get a price. It's about $4 a year for a student. So the access, um, we purchased it as a six year um, access using the number of grade level licenses, which winds up being about um, 26 to $27 for the six years. So it's a little over $4 a student for the year. Um, and that provides them the digital access both to this online library of, I think it's over 300,000 works of art, which also has allowed it to be much more dynamic and much more um, multicultural and um, much more current in, uh, in terms of that library. Um, Mr. Twenty, is there anything I need to add that I forgot? Oh, that was that was wonderful. Uh, it's it's um, <laughs> you know it's it brings in all of our contemporary artists as well, and and really is a great supplement for everything that happens in the classroom. So thank you. Thank, thank you, I'm Mr. Good Twenty. Teacher. Thank you, Miss Shay. <laughs> um, Mr. Thomas, it looks like you have a question. Yes, thank you. So. Um, in 2008, that's I think the year I started kindergarten. Um, so I, I'm wondering for these textbooks, I, I don't remember ever using a textbook in elementary school or during my visual arts class or in middle school or in high school. So, yeah. you know, how is this new contract going to really be implemented in the classroom? Are, how are students going to be using the textbook, using the digital resources? Because I don't know what we used, but we didn't use a textbook when I was in, in art classes. So I'll start and then Mr. Twenty, I'd, I'd ask you to, to jump in. So um, one of the main, as we keep emphasizing, is for students to have access to contemporary artwork. You probably had one example of a piece of art in the front of your classroom sitting on the chalk ledge. <laughs> and so we want our students to have access to much more art, to many more contemporary artists that represent a much more diverse range of artists. Um, we also want them to be able to explore different media of art um, rather than having that one sort of um, um, sometimes two-dimensional and, and occasionally there's a, an actual example in the front of the classroom. In terms of the daily instruction, I'm certainly going to let Mr. Twenty jump in, but the design of our visual arts curriculum um, often starts with teachers having um, an expectation of the core art standards, the type of art and the medium is really up to the teacher. So they use different materials when designing how they're going to have students demonstrate um, those core art standards. And so the hope is that by having a core arts textbook, we're having a baseline of resources. So we don't have one school that has a teacher that's able to access lots of different um, art resources because perhaps they graduated from MICA and have all these of their own resources. Some of what happened, um, and I'm, I'm gonna go a little off track here, but I think it's important. This group knows we've been talking about our culturally responsive curriculum scorecard and a lot of the work that we've been doing. And what we found when talking with our teachers is some of our teachers were not exposed to a wide range of art, even in their own um, art education. And so part of what we're trying to do is open that up so that the art that our students are exposed to is not relegated to that just which what I'm familiar with as a teacher myself. Um, Mr. Twain, I'm going to turn to you if there's anything else you want to talk about, it, just about the daily instruction that might help answer Mr. Thomas's question. Sure, and, and, and to pull off of that as well, um, we, we have noticed, especially in the last few years, a, a large push everywhere from museums uh, into textbooks. Uh, so the companies that are writing them, Davis being uh, the author of this one, um, a, a very significant push to understanding we want to see a wider range. You know, it's not just exactly like you were saying that one poster that was sitting on, you know, those posters came in a set, you know, that was what it was back then. Um, and at this point, um, these textbooks, the the textbook, the physical textbook has great information. It walks through all, all of the, uh, the lessons and the pieces, but the digital version of this just goes above and beyond. So what they've done is really taken all of the resources that could be important for any teacher to pull into and added them and done it in such a way that it's it's just a, a huge conglomeration of of different styles different artists still meeting those same standards still looking in the same direction so it is up to that teacher deciding you know we're we're doing painting in this one when another teacher might be doing something in sculpture and still being able to meet those standards and go through it and have that set of resources that really backs them um, the the database of artwork is amazing that they have um, and even and it, it goes beyond it adds the the level of scanning that they've done on these so you can scan and and blow them up very large and that may seem like a, a simple thing but having taught you know students uh, that have that have had vision impairments and things like that it makes a huge difference to be able to zoom in and actually be able to see a texture being able to see what what it could feel like on the real painting that you know no one would ever be able to get close enough to to, to actually see so uh, the textbook itself that that whole building process behind it Davis has really taken to a, another level and, and has you know translated that in for our teachers there's a lot of uh, different curriculum builders and things teachers can take what's there in the textbooks and kind of curate their own listing so 
it's it's much easier for them to pull into their own uh, slide decks, things like that. Um, so it really just offers a, a huge wide range of resources that were very difficult or, or not even existent to find before. Thank you. That, that was an incredible response from both you and, and Ms. Shea. Um, my no, uh, next question I have, um, and this is my final question, is this is for elementary school um, textbooks. Are there plans to move to secondary schools and to provide an online textbook for secondary school students as well in the future? Go ahead, sure. Mr. Okay, I was going to jump to that. So uh, we actually have uh, the Davis version of this for our Fundamentals of Art course. Oh. Uh, so, so this is out there. We have had uh, experience coming through the process, going through with what the interface is like. So we already know how, um, you know, the, the best methods to train our teachers to go to work with them through the whole process, kind of how to, to demonstrate, but also give them that firsthand experience as they're going through it and how to access it with students, uh, things like that. So yeah, and, and um, Having say, you know, our last couple of years going through this, it's been uh, incredibly helpful to have such a, a robust resource available uh, in the remote setting. And it's still being used now, especially with you know, students that, that aren't able to be in the classroom, they, they still pick it up and have uh, resources available. Thank you. What year was that? Was that uh, probably start? right after you took that course, yeah. Mr. Thomas? I'm going to double nice. check the year, but I think it's been in the last probably three, three years, okay. maybe. I'll double check the date. <laughs> Thank you. Before I turn it over to um, Ms. Causey for her question, I do have a question. Um, Ms. Shea, how many physical books are we talking about with this contract? I'm gonna pull up the quote because we did it by class sets, by the number of art teachers, by grade level. So if you give me one second, I can get that for you. Unless Mr. Twenty knows off the top of his head. <laughs> I, if I can remember back on the page, um, I believe it's 30 physical textbooks are heading into classrooms. Right. Um, and then for I can say the number of teachers. Um, yeah, so 106 schools, I believe, got this that set, and I think 32. I want to say Sorry, I'm going question. off memory here. I yeah, I'm pulling it up. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of windows open for all of my different presentations. Give me one second. I'll look at the fifth grade. Um, so we have yes. Um, so it's 138 um, class sets of 30 plus the teacher edition and the e-resources. And then it's close to 10,000, up to 10,000 licenses because of course our student enrollment at any grade level varies. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Ms. Causey, it looks like you had a question. Thank you, thank you for that presentation um, and nice seeing you Mr. Twenty. Thank you for your work. I love art. I believe it's so important for our children to have creativity nurtured as they grow. Um, and then as they experience different things, they can choose what cr sort of creative uh, outlet they enjoy, whether it's dance or music or art um, or sports or whatever else they do. Um, so I, I, I love all of this conversation. I just wanted to clarify the um, rollout. So which it's fifth grade that's going to start and then is it going to flow down or go to middle school? And it then um, are, it sounds like the digital version is going to be available to any student? So um, it will be the digital version goes with whatever grade level. So we originally had identified first, third and fifth as the first three grade levels that we will start with. So um, likely we'll start with fifth grade and then um, based on funding availability and also based on the rollout with fifth grade would determine whether we did first and third or maybe just did first or third next. And then eventually we'd fill in in between. Part of that is because it's the same art teacher, so we would just um, need to, um, and Mr. Twenty can and chime in too, so you might say why didn't we pick every other grade level, but some of that is because the visual arts teachers can look using the first grade materials can also support K and one, third grade, second and third, and then fifth, fourth and fifth, so that's why we had identified that sort of stepping stone approach, if you will. That's great, thank you. Mr. Offerman? None this time. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, may I have a motion, please, to approve elementary visual arts textbooks? So moved, so moved. Ms. Causey. Second. May I have a second, please, Mr. Thomas? And may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Mr. Twenty, for your first curriculum committee. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Thank Twenty. you. Wonderful meeting, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next, Mr. Corns, if you could go back one slide. Dr. McComas, is it okay if I go on to the next one? 
I know I'm just trying to roll us along. Um, so this is, I'm sure, something you're very familiar with, our Bridges in Mathematics curriculum. We have finally made it to the point where we are at K through five, which is very exciting. We are going to be coming um, forward. I am joined today by our Director of Mathematics, and I believe this is her first time at Curriculum Committee, so I do want to take an opportunity to introduce um, Ms. Kaseli Mshinda. She is our um, Director of Mathematics Pre-K through 12, um, and she is here to be my um, wing person uh, to support me with questions as this comes through. So as you know, we have implemented as part of our response to the Johns Hopkins audit as part of our commitment to completely overhaul the math curriculum. Um, we are now at the place where we have bridges in every classroom K through five. What we are seeking when we bring the contract forward is an increase in spending authority. Um, and we have several really good reasons why we want to increase the spending authority. The first is because we have a commitment to replenish consumable materials. So the bridges curriculum um, includes um, a workbook. Um, or practice book, a number corner practice book. So you'll remember number corner is a separate component. And then it also has a home connections book. And so each year of the program, we centrally replenish those consumables based on student enrollment for schools so that students each have the individual materials to take home and use as part of the program. We also um, are, as part of the budget process you heard, have sought funding to be able to purchase Spanish language resources. So we are very fortunate that our core resource for elementary math is also published in Spanish. Now, we are not yet at the point where math is taught in Spanish, but having the materials in Spanish would allow our multilingual learners who speak Spanish as their native language, as well as some of our not multilingual learners who come from a family who also um, speaks um, Spanish to have those Spanish language resources as a support. So they would not get Spanish materials instead, but in addition to, which is why we need the additional spending authority. Um, we also have heard from schools that are using their school funds to purchase additional kits. So for example, the system purchases, every teacher has their own teaching kit. We also purchased intervention kits for each school using grant funds last year. Um, in some instances, some of our schools have bought even more on top of that. They wanted, maybe, perhaps they had used Title I funds to hire an additional small group teacher and they wanted them to have their own um, intervention kit. So we saw contracts being, uh, purchase orders being put forward from schools buying additional intervention kits. Um, we also know this year there is a shift to um, school-based summer school design. So each school's leadership team is able to design a homegrown uh, summer school program. And as we've been meeting with elementary schools and coaching and listening to principals about what they're designing, many of them are doing a deeper dive within Bridges and are looking to purchase supplemental materials to support that homegrown summer um, program. So we want to ensure that even though those are um, grant funds, that the contract reflects that spending authority to allow them to do that. Um, and of course, we're always offering ongoing professional learning as we have new hires or as teachers change, uh, change grade levels. We do work um, to contract the Math Learning Center, the publisher of Bridges, to help support that professional learning as well. And so um, while when we first brought the Bridges contract forward, we um, always do our best to calculate how much we believe we're going to spend um, over five years. Um, we did get ahead of that spending because of what I just mentioned. When we were given the grant funds two years ago um, as part of ESSER, we were able to accelerate and buy all those intervention kits. Um, we also, during the pandemic, shifted how we shipped materials to school, which increased the shipping costs. So we were shipping directly to schools um, as they had enrollment changes, which of course is more expensive. So all of that means we um, spent faster in the spending authority than we had originally anticipated, um, and then also have these additional needs I just described in terms of the Spanish language and the summer school, all of which we believe is good news, but requires us to increase that spending authority. Ms. Machinda, is there anything that I left out that you want to add? No, I think that covers everything. We have our um, continued professional learning, the um, Spanish materials and making sure that we have those at every grade level, and to your point, the shipping and making sure that we actually calculate it on the front end. Thank you. Th uh, nice to meet you, Ms. Machinda. Um, board, uh, Ms. Causey, you have a question? Yes, I was just wondering if um, Ms. Mishinda, nice to meet you, uh, could expand a little bit more on the professional learning, um, how much uh, that involves. We know that we um, have um, 
turnover in the elementary level. And so as we're getting in those um, new teachers or new to Baltimore County, um, you know, we want them to get up to speed as well. So if you could just uh, unpack that some. Sure. So the ways that we're looking at professional learning are for the new teacher academy, as you mentioned, but then also for professional study day, a revisit for current teachers. And then we're looking at a facilitator training. So um, the Bridges, the math learning center offers a training that will allow us to be trained the trainer model so that we don't have to continue to go back and actually request funding for training and they're offering that to us. In fact, they're actually building me a quote around that now so that maybe we, we train our resource teachers and our core central staff and then we don't have to um, continuously year after year procure training from the math learning center, uh, but they have uh, $1,500 per 30 seats if it is a remote training. $3,000 per 30 seats if it is an in-person training. And, and generally we're doing remote training at this point, so we could look at that number. Um, and that really constant, between the shipping and the professional learning, that is just under 20% of the increase in the ask. It's the most of the increase in the ask is around the consumables, but we are looking at providing professional learning for new staff um, at those rates. And if I could just add the training, I believe, and please, I, I know it changes. I think it's uh, two days, um, the training, two full days. Is that still correct? And then correct. there's um, homework in between. We sometimes call it intercession work to make it sound better, but it's homework for the teachers in between. I do have a question. Um, and you. Dr. McComas and Ms. Shea, you'll remember this conversation. Um, I have a go to teacher who is highly educated, has tons of experience and this year moved from first grade to fourth grade. And she she told me that she understands how Bridges is ultimately going to help students. But as a teacher, she finds the amount of work that she has to do to prepare to deliver the, the lessons. Very just so detail, very arduous, um, and she specifically mentioned flip charts. And I thought when we looked at Bridges, we looked at it as a program that was a packaged program that provided materials that teachers could, like open court, they could open the box and teach the course. Mm -hmm. But I'm hearing teachers at every level say that they have so much work to do to prepare to deliver lessons via Bridges. And my question is, is there anything that the company offers that would take the onus off of teachers so that they could open the box per se and deliver the lesson? So um, Ms. Machina, if I can go first and then I'm going to invite you to jump in. So first, I, I would be remiss, Ms. Mack, if I said, well, I want teachers to have what they need. I'm never going to eliminate planning. Teachers are always going to have to plan, even with a, a program as um, direct and explicit as open court because of course teachers know their children and that variable is not included in the book. Um, I hear the same thing. Teachers are, it is a big adjustment and Bridges is very different and, and especially um, with the flip chart. So my first note is we don't want teachers making flip charts. They actually don't need to use flip charts. It's what they know. It's how they knew to prepare the sequence of a lesson um, and it was effective for them in the in the previous curriculum. And so what we're experiencing right now, um, they don't need to make a single flip chart and they could teach Bridges. Bridges actually has pre-prepared. When you talk about like open the kit, Bridges has digital whiteboard materials that teachers could project that are interactive, that pre-sequence um, the problem strings or the different routines that they have through Number Corner. They have digital and print versions of Number Corner resources. Um, but we're in this transition, right? And so teachers are spending, they are, they are not exaggerating, it is a lot. Um, and they're, the first time you go through anything, it is harder because you don't necessarily see the forest for the trees yet. And so many of our teachers are getting caught off guard when, what do you mean I have to cut out 20 shoes for this uh, hands-on learning for my first graders to understand perimeter? And that's time and effort, you know, but they'll have those 20 shoes for next year. They won't, you know, so some of it is also because um, the first time you're going through the actual preparation is different. 
Um, the other piece that I will offer uh, that we are doing about that, and this is where I'm going to, um, so I want to, you know, first validate what they're saying. It is hard. Um, it is a transition. Um, it is also a very different approach to teaching math. The former, especially in the intermediate grades, the former curriculum was not as problem based and exploratory. It was much more, I do a problem, we do a couple together, and then the, the students do it. Um, that was uh, definitely less preparation on the part of the teacher in terms of the planning. There's no disputing that. Um, in terms of what we're doing to support, and so you asked two questions. The company does provide whiteboard digital display materials that would take the place of a traditional flip chart. Um, it's a little different in the, in the way teachers are getting used to it. Some teachers love it. Some teachers haven't embraced it just yet. Um, in terms of what we're doing about it, so you know from uh, hearing that our team has really been covering schools. We haven't really been operating as a resource because the primary need has been for us to help keep our schools open during this most recent surge. We're starting to get some relief from that. We're starting to be able to make plans about central office support. And one of those plans is that we are building um, video model lessons. We are going to actually have resource teachers um, actually do two parts. We're going to be planning uh, videotaping planning sessions. So we're actually going to have a video library of how to plan and prepare for bridges to hopefully make that easier and more streamlined for teachers. Um, we're also then going to have that same lesson that was planned videoed so teachers will be able to see sort of from start to finish how do um, math teachers approach the planning? What are some of the questions that they're thinking about in preparation? And then what are some of the decisions they're making when they execute that in a classroom, um, including a debriefing with that um, model teacher after? So that's um, we're just just starting that though because of course we have not had our, our staff um, and so it you know I want to both validate what they're saying but also affirm that uh, we have to Red Rover stick together and and stay with it because it is an evidence-based curriculum um, we are starting to see blips of growth in some of our data that is a positive sign so this is not the time for us to abandoned um, so we just need to continue to support our teachers and and really rely on that evidence base and the experience of districts that have done this um, before i have every confidence that the teachers in baltimore county are just as capable as the teachers in other districts that have done this we're just uh, unfortunately rolled out a brand new curriculum during a pandemic which is is certainly not ideal for a number of reasons so miss machine is there anything you want to add in terms of uh, supports that we're doing yeah, you were actually very thorough. I, I started to think about the videos that we were creating and the fact that I myself am trying the curriculum on so that as a novice, I can see what are all of those places where teachers are truly feeling it. I want to feel exactly what they're feeling so that we can support them in time with whatever that that might be. So how do I finish a number corner in 20 minutes? What does that look and feel like and providing that kind of support not only to teachers, but to building leadership as well so that they know when they get teachers who are, are, are giving them this kind of feedback how they can push into support with the, here's a video we can bring in someone to kind of walk shoulder to shoulder with you on how to to lift this for students um and so I, again I, I agree um to miss shay's point around the experience with something new uh, and not only the product but also the pedagogy that is new because of the product right I, I was going to add that to um, it's the math is better. So the, the math is harder uh, in terms of um, actual the, the depth of understanding. Um, I will share very briefly. I had a recent success story with a teacher using ratio tables because that's a big part of bridges that was nowhere in the previous curriculum. We never really used them and they're uh, critical to the thinking. And uh, last year the teacher just did didn't use them <laughs> just and this year she actually sent me an email and was like okay I get it now and and my kids understood and now I'm in but it took her a bit and and I think that that's just part of what we have to support and thank you for all of that and uh, believe me I'm not um advocating that we get rid of it I just sure. wanted to tell you what I've heard and of then course. my concern from an equity perspective is the teacher um with whom I've been speaking and, and I have validated this with many teachers. She is the type of person who will work until midnight doing what she has to do. And not all teachers have that ability or that desire. And I am concerned about the disparate impact that it may have on our students. So 
Um, I, I just think it's, I, I thank you for validating that you are also hearing it. And I just think we need to be aware of it and do whatever we can to Maybe. make it as seamless as possible for our teachers. So that's the end of my comments. Anybody yeah. else have a comment or a question? Oh, Mr. Thomas, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, that explanation. It, it was incredible. It was very thorough, um, as, as was mentioned before. Um, when I had visited a few schools and I was talking to our elementary school teachers about Bridges, I heard so many incredible things about the curriculum, how much they loved it. But I also heard one concern that I wanted to bring up, and that was that they felt like, uh, or my first question actually is, how was Bridges implemented? Was it like every single grade level at the same time is starting or, or kind of how was it implemented? Can you share that first? Sure. Um, so again, I'll start, Ms. Machinda, because we implemented it before we hired Ms. Machinda, so <laughs> in fairness, um, we actually piloted bridges twice, believe it or not. So we actually first piloted bridges uh, probably four or five years ago when we were initially thinking about shifting the curriculum and then it didn't go anywhere and we wound up staying with the curriculum. And then um, four years ago, we did the Johns Hopkins audit, which came back and said that we needed to completely overhaul the curriculum. That year, just before the pandemic, we started a pilot. So we piloted it in every grade level, K through five. Mm -hmm. um, and then the following year, we rolled it out just in K to two with the full curriculum. And then third through fifth grade teachers had just the number corner, uh, which is similar, but very different from the old sort of calendar math. It's a self-contained, about 20 to 25 minute portion of the day. Um, and then third through fifth followed um, this year. And so we've had, we now, so it was actually a three year rollout um, mm -hmm. from pilot to um, full implementation. Thank you for explaining that. I, so I'm assuming that I was, I think I was in a third grade classroom or fourth grade classroom when they were saying that they felt like starting the students with bridges in fourth grade, like they just wish that they had, it had started. Yeah. It would have been like a phased in like kindergarten. Sure. Then, so and it, yeah, and so um, there is a philosophy about, and I've had some people say, why don't we start with kindergarten? And then the kindergartners are like our first cohort. Yeah. And we follow that student because it is a challenge. And I'm glad you brought that up because they're not wrong. The curriculum doesn't know that it's their first year, right? So the right. curriculum believes they've been in that Bridges high quality evidence based curriculum since kindergarten. And so we're filling in gaps. Um, the challenge with that is the sense of urgency we have around our math achievement. Yeah. If we followed that, it would be four or five years before we had in front of every student an evidence based high quality instructional material. And we just in, in education, we don't do that. And while it, it's hard, if we know that what we had in front of kids, we had an audit that said it was not good enough. Um, we really just had a sense of it's also why we couldn't pause in the pandemic. Like I said, that's not anyone's idea of a fun time. But when you have that sense of urgency around data and what we know we need to set our students to secondary with that solid foundation from elementary curriculum, it really would have put it, our, too many of our students at a disadvantage. Thank you, and and thank you for explaining that, Miss Shay. Um, I saw Dr. McComas, you you turning your mic for a second, but that that makes a lot of sense, and uh, I I really admire the urgency that the curriculum department took to to make sure we had bridges in our classroom. Um, I wish I had it as as a, as an elementary school student so I could experience it, but I love visiting the schools now and getting to see the students in action with it. Thank you. If there are no further questions, do I have a motion to approve bridges in math? So Mathematics. Moved. Is there a second? Second, Posse. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I will now turn it back to you, Dr. McComas, for our last item. Yes, ma'am. So um, first of all, just let me say thank you uh, once again, members of our committee for your support. Um, and most importantly, thank you for the opportunity to really get in and discuss these resources, the what, why, how of it. Um, we're, we're very excited and very committed to make sure our students have and our teachers have everything they need um, to take care of our students in the learning process. So we, we could not do that without uh, this committee. And um, and I just want to say thank you. Um, so with no further ado, uh, we're going to move on to our second part of today's um, time together. And it's really, you know, we're very committed to making sure that each and every one of you as um, members of our board have the best and deepest understanding um, around what goes into the teaching and learning process and the many facets. Um, and so today uh, we're really coming forward and talking 
talking about Fontas and Pinnell, um, looking to build your understanding and your uh, knowledge base so that as you're making decisions on behalf of our children and our teachers, you understand how these different resources fit into the complexity of the work. So I'll turn it over to uh, our true content experts, um, Miss Shea and Miss Kraft, and I think you had uh, Miss Dr. Wolf, I think is with us as well. Um, and I'll let them take it away in the time that we have. OK, great, thank you. And we appreciate the opportunity because I know there's a lot of um, consternation regarding um, Fondas and Pinnell. And I, and I think this is a great opportunity for us to um, hopefully clarify exactly where we are, um, where we've been and where we're going. So that's really the approach that we took um, in putting this together. And we're going to be brief on the front end because we want to make sure we have time for your questions so that we make sure that you leave here with um, feeling as if you understand um, where we've been and, and where we're going. So Mr. Corns, if you can go to the next slide, um, I'm going to just give a broad overview and then I'll turn it over to, to Ms. Kraft. And Dr. Wolf, the first thing that I want to just level set from a language perspective um, is you'll hear people call it Fontas and Pinnell. So when you hear from a lot of folks around the approach for teaching reading, you will hear people who um, we in, in ELA land, we often call it the reading wars, right? So you'll have camps of people that um, believe in guided reading or balanced literacy, and you'll have you'll hear lots of different um, terms called that. Then you'll also hear from advocates um, who talk about structured literacy and, and talk about a much more explicit approach. And so what I want to level set is in Baltimore County, um, we do approach with structured literacy. We have a systematic and explicit curriculum for phonics instruction. We do not teach children to guess. We do not approach reading instruction as if there is not a science and a phonology for how sounds make uh, sounds are represented by letter symbol correspondence. We teach syllables, we teach morphology, and we teach decoding and encoding. We have also purchased materials called the benchmark assessment system and they use a leveling system that was identified by two individuals whose last names are Fontas and Pinnell. So I also want to level set some people I think maybe don't even know that Fontas and Pinnell is actually their last names and they have a leveling system. And so we have purchased the assessment system, which is called the benchmark assessment system. The benchmark assessment system includes passages that have been leveled according to this leveling system from Fontes and Pinnell. They were that those materials were approved by the curriculum committee back in 2016. And I'm going to let Ms. Kraft and Dr. Wolf talk a little bit about how that assessment system was originally envisioned and how it still may be used today. But I wanted to um, level set that it is absolutely not curriculum and is not the approach that we take in Baltimore County with how we teach children to read. We absolutely use structured literacy and have systematic and explicit instruction and phonics. We do, however, have leveled materials in schools, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we use them. So Ms. Kraft or Dr. Wolf, do you want to pick up here with how we started with the benchmark assessment system and then how we're using it today? Yes, and uh, Dr. Wolf actually had to run to an appointment. Oh, okay, um, so and you and me. So it's just me. <laughs> you and me. <laughs> all right, I'll be with you. Um, so you can also jump in to sure. Ms. Shea, knowing some of that. Um, yes. Uh, history. Um, however, I will pick up here and say that um, originally when it was purchased, it was it was purchased with what we knew at the time, which was leveling um, and, le and matching students to readers, right? And so the idea behind it was always well intentioned, right? So we would put students at a, a, a level that they could be successful at. Um, and as Maya Angelou tells us, when we know better, we do better. And so we know so much. And as many of you know, and I'll share again, but I'm getting my doctorate at Hopkins um, in mind, brain, and teaching. So for me, the science of reading is like my bread and butter. Like I um, love it so much that I went and got a degree in it. Um, and so um, we do know, we do, we we have all kinds of technology that shows us how students learn to read, where they start to struggle, the difficulty that happens in the brain, the disconnection, so we know those things. 
Um, so again, at a time where we knew less um, and, you know, we did know a lot less like the, you know, not just fMRIs, but they've been able to advance a lot of technology to really study the brain um, so that we know actually what happens when students read. We said, OK, so this doing this leveling system doesn't work and doesn't provide the productive struggle that a student would need to really close the gap systematically. And so what we saw nationally, not just in Baltimore County, is that students that started in intervention in elementary school were still in intervention in high school. And part of it was that philosophy of that. Let me put you at your what we were calling your independent or instructional level. And so what we know now is that all students need access to complex text. The teacher is uh, the person that provides the scaffolds needed for the student to be successful. Um, however, um, the benchmark assessment system is still used to listen to students read aloud, and there is a huge value in listening to how students read. And so when we listen to students read aloud, and I still did this even when I taught at that, you know, I've taught at elementary and high, and so even when I had high school readers, I would li once a week, they read to me, and there were things that informed what I was going to teach the next week. And so you would learn things like their prosody, you would learn fluency, you would learn accuracy. Um, are they just guessing at words or were they actually trying to decode them? And so there are all types of things that happen when we listen to students read and we have given guidance to schools around how they can use those materials. And one of the ways that they that they are not to use it is to level a student and say, um, Megan is a D and she's only going to read D text. Um, Jennifer is a an A and she's only going to get these wordless books, right? And so that's one thing that we've made very clear. Um, we have pushed guidance out and we have talked about it extensively at our reading specialist meetings. And if I can add before we get to the yeah. next slide too, um, I did put some information down at the bottom because I know Ms. Mack, when you originally asked questions, you were asking related to the budget. And, and so that's why we put that in bold. Um, these uh, kits that we mentioned, um, because there is a time and space to listen to a reader. Some of the assessments that we're gonna talk about that we use, um, for example, MAP, um, students are taking in an adaptive setting on the computer. It's very different what we can learn about your reader than if I just sit shoulder to shoulder and can observe your reading habits. Um, things that I can build upon for you as a reader, as your teacher. Um, but I did want to emphasize that since 2017, zero dollars from the ELA budget have been allocated to purchase That's the benchmark correct. assessment system, lovingly known as Fonda Central. Fonda Central. Now. Yeah, um, correct. So, and in fact, the contract sunset on June 30th of 2021. Um, on the next slide, this is directly lifted from Ms. Kraft just referenced the guidance that they've been given to our reading specialists. So I wanted to, um, I'll send it back to Ms. Kraft because um, it's really important that we also not vilify this practice of listening to students read. And so there is a place where this becomes another data point that teachers are using in combination with multiple other data points. Again, not as curriculum. We have explicit instruction mm -hmm. in structured literacy in the open core curriculum, um, but I'm going to let Ms. Kraft talk a little bit also because I know she's a, a research guru about the guidance that we have continued to give to schools about the appropriate use of these resources. Right, so the number one thing that we've given the guidance around is that it is not to be used to determine only to determine a level of a student. Um, it can be used to observe reading behaviors in a one on one um, situation with the teacher and the student um, so that you can make some formative assessment decisions. And so listening to a student read aloud will really give you um, ways to understand how fluent is the student, how accurate are they when they read and what is their comprehension and some of that is you know, not just reading these words in isolation, but actually having a chance to for them to read um, a longer text and hear the types of um, phrasings that they have to hear if they read a sentence and it doesn't make sense because they have missed a word if they go back because that tells me now about their comprehension level. So there's a lot of pieces that you get um, when you listen to a student read. And so that's why the kids are still in the school because we do want to encourage um, 
teachers to listen. There is a time and place to listen to students read. Um, and so this is a piece of data and only in a minute I'm going to talk about lots of pieces of data, but this is a piece of data that a teacher could use in a formative way to learn more about their students. Um, and, and then, oh, go ahead, Michelle. No, go ahead. Are you going to finish this part? Are you going to talk about the report cards? Um, nope, I was going to talk about the actual okay. leveled reader. So go ahead and finish your report cards. Okay. And, talk about the um, and then just of note, um, there used to be a spot on the report card where levels were reported, and that is now removed from the report card. So there's no, um, there is no guidance from us or any structure in place that is encouraging that use of determining a level. Okay, I'm passing it back to you, Mache. Well, and I was going, what I was going to share next is just like there is an appropriate time to use those um, resources to listen to a child read, there is also an appropriate moment for a level text. And so you will hear us talk about flooding classrooms of libraries. So there's a time for students to have complex text that's at grade level. There's a time for students to read decodable text. So when we're teaching um, open court, we specifically use what we call the decodables or the open court decodable readers that are phonetically predictable based on the sequence, the scope and sequence of that systematic phonics instruction. Once students have learned that code, there is a place then for them to have wide access to a range of books. And so there is an opportunity, sometimes in small groups, for us to read what we call text sets. So mm -hmm. you might start with a text that is more comfortable to build your background knowledge and vocabulary as a, um, an on-ramp to a more complex text that's written at grade level so that you've had an opportunity to build your background knowledge and that vocabulary exposure at something that's really more independent and comfortable for you as a reader. Um, so the importance, as I, I started talking about the reading wars, while we're really clear about the science of how we have to do direct instruction in a systematic and explicit way, we also know that once we've done that, there is a space for students to have baskets and baskets and baskets of books yes. um, so that they have multiple opportunities to develop also just a love of reading. Um, so go ahead to the next slide, if you will. Mr. I know. And then I, I'm going to add to that, Ms. Shea, because that was, I mean, like now you're just, you, you've started me, um, but I'll keep it brief. Um, so like, for example, in first grade, um, if you look at a, a leveled reader, um, they, the, 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 I mean, first grade would cover like C to I, like, it's, so if you're talking about that traditional leveling system, right? And so I do want to say, and I think Ms. Shea teed this up beautifully, that a level, we also Lexile books right like so we know what level they are so we don't want to vilify the level what what we want to vilify is the practice of pigeonholing um jennifer into she reads at a c even though she's a fifth grader and the only thing i'm going to let her touch are c level books and so um, even when we have leveled readers in the classroom, as long as they're the appropriate grade level band and um, like Ms. Shea said of interest, that's just wide reading. Right. What we want to prevent is from saying who gets to access grade level curriculum. So thank you, Ms. Shea, for making sure that we hit that point. So important. Well, I don't want anyone packing up books because they think they're doing something. That's right. And, and yeah. so a level is like a Lexile. Is like, so we've looked at the readability and we say that this is it, but there is a range range of levels that are appropriate for any grade level and we do want them wide reading. I also want to offer that there are places in the country where um, the instructional approach is a guided reading approach or the curriculum is a guided reading curriculum. That is not the case in Baltimore County. And so that's really important too because as you read national resources and people talk about how far we've come in understanding the science of reading, um, you know, we've worked really hard in Baltimore County to have Orton Gillingham training, to have letters training, to have open court in every classroom because we know the science and we believe that that science belongs in the classroom. Yeah. Um, and we believe we need trained professionals to do it. So I just wanted to be as explicit as possible about what we do and what we don't do so that we could develop some understanding. Um, this last slide talked about, we mentioned one data point. So there is a moment when sitting down shoulder to shoulder to listen to a student read is a really critical um, piece of data that teachers can gather. Ms. Croft, do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. how these different data points are included in our um, practices? 
So one of the things that we really heavily emphasize is that we um, look at multiple data points together. So when we're looking at how a student is doing and what they might need, uh, what their strengths are, what are areas of growth, that we look at this comprehensive picture and we don't look at one data point at one moment in time. Um, and so um, we have lots of different data points that we encourage the use of. And so, um, of course, we have dibbles and actually we're, we were looking at it today. Um, our um, actual um, um, numbers are looking great for actually administering um, and our and actually the performance is looking good. Um, you know, I think that there's some encouraging things coming out of dibbles. Um, there are these wonderful embedded assessments with an open court, which is um, reflective for the teacher, but also what the student is learning. So those help, you know, guide instruction um, at an individual level, a small group level and a whole um, a whole class level. Um, our curriculum based assessments provide another piece of data to look at. Um, of course, we have map R, which gives us again another piece of data. And I know we all heard at the last board meeting, um, or I guess two ago, um, about our map data and what that was looking like. And, you know, pretty encouraging there also. Um, we also have, um, if we do detect that there are some, we're looking at multiple data points and we're saying, okay, a student is struggling, um, there might be two additional um, pieces of data that we gather. So rather than using um, the benchmark assessment system, um, we're going to look at something like the decoding survey or the phonological awareness screening test. And both of this, those will provide us information about where if a student is not reading how we would expect at this moment in time, where the breakdown might be. That way we can make sure that when we do provide some an, an additional services or intensive support that we are giving them exactly what they need because the goal is always to close the gap as quick as possible and get them back into core curriculum. So that is basically all the slides that we put together. We wanted to give a detailed, uh, lots of details um, about sort of where we've been and where we are, um, but then really want, just wanted to provide an opportunity for what questions are coming up for all of you because we know this is a topic of interest. Um, and this is not just in Baltimore County. This is, you know, if you're on Twitter, if you are um, just reading in the news, the, these reading wars are real and, and yeah. people are, are really passionate. Um, and, and probably no two individuals more passionate than Ms. Kraft and I around um, how students learn to read. Um, so we are certainly open to, I do wanna make one more um, comment about a, uh, an intervention program called LLI, because I know that has come up too. So um, while it's not in the presentation, LLI stands for Leveled Literacy Intervention. It is an intervention that was also developed by Fontes and Pinnell. Um, I, again, I referenced to what Ms. Kraft said about what you know at the time, and it's important when we think about any program um, that we not um, use sweeping generalizations. Mm -hmm. So one data point that I will share with you around LLI is several years ago when they reauthorized the Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA, there was a website districts had to go to called Evidence for ESSA and you had to use that website to determine whether or not it met the highest level of evidence before you could use specific funds to purchase resources. Um, LLI got the highest rating of strongest evidence. So it was highly rated under um, ESSA it's highly rated for a specific type of reader. It is yeah. not appropriate for a student with dyslexia or a student who is still learning to decode. So again, misuse, misapplication, broad strokes are part of the problem, but it's really important that we um, acknowledge um, sort of how these resources came to be and, and understand that full picture of that menu of resources that we need to provide for our readers. So um, I meant to add that to the presentation and forgot. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, Moshe. True. And now we're just open for questions. Well, thank you all very much. Um, since I asked for this, I think I'm going to kick this off. Um, sure. I want to acknowledge that I know we have worked very hard as a district to use um, evidence based explicit reading instruction and Dr. McComas and I have had conversations that we do believe we're beginning to, to reap the benefits mm -hmm. of that. But I guess my concern is um, I don't know that the message is getting out 
to teachers the way that you think it is. I spent the week talking to teachers at many of the schools in my district, and here's the answers that I got. Um, oh, I just provided some reports to, to two parents um, using the leveling, um, saying that the student was here and now is here, and that's in 2022. I have had teachers tell me, we were just told if we wanted to use it, we could use it. And then I have had teachers tell me that we're not using it at all. So back to equity, if there is value in this, and my next point might argue the fact that there is value, um, we need to be more consistent, I think, across the district in what teachers are delivering to our students. So my next point is, Apparently, this is seen as so harmful. The state of Maryland, the Department of Education, is now compensating school systems that totally stop using any part of Fontis and Pinnell. Um, you mean, I'm sorry, did you say Maryland or Michigan? Ma Massachusetts. Massachusetts, I was going to yes, say. It's Massachusetts. Not like, wait, what? Massachusetts. Right. <laughs> no, Massachusetts, Massachusetts. And, and you can go online yeah. and find yeah. it. And, I got the article. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and that concerns me. And then, look, I, I think if we have the books, we should definitely use the supplemental readers because and, I am a reader mm -hmm. and I would read anything. I need yeah. to have a book in my hand, so I would read it. So as far as the supplemental reader, I'm fine with that. That's not um, what but I would say clarify, that's not what the Massachusetts they're talking about the explicit curriculum. So there are specific curricula that instead of teaching system, structured literacy like we have with open core, there are districts in the state that right. don't have a structured literacy curriculum that only use the methods outlined. And that's what they're talking about replacing. They're not packing up baskets of books. No, no, and I understand that, and I'm not. I would never advocate for right. getting rid of books. I'm a book lover, right. and I do think, although I would ask if if that's what we're using, that we look at whether that's the most cost effective way of providing supplemental reading materials for students. I guess I just I would like us to have a more unified approach to this. And in my mind, what I've learned over the last three years, it just seems to be in direct conflict with. Um, with Orton Gillingham and Open Court and um, programs like that. So I appreciate this presentation. Um, I, You guys are the experts, but I am very concerned that we have parents who are still getting reading levels for their kids. We have parents who are being told their kids are making growth, but they're still, even though they've made significant growth, there's still many grade levels behind. And I, and I'm happy to hear that it's not going to be on the report card, but some schools are absolutely using this in discussion with parents. And thank and you. I don't I, and I just want to offer that's not necessarily a bad thing. So your point about consistency is one that we constantly strive for. And I know that Dr. McComas has already been meeting with the new chief of schools. I think she was probably his first meeting after he was named the next morning because we know that that partnership with the Division of School Support and Achievement, um, that slide number two was directly lifted from the presentation we gave to every reading specialist. So when you talk about consistency, that was the message. We we lifted that slide from the training we did with reading specials. The challenge then is reading specialists getting it in front of principals and making sure that teachers are using it in the same way. The second thing that I want to offer is that can be a valuable additional piece of information for a parent. So when we send when when parents see map data, it will also come with a Lexile range that is huge and parents might say, I don't even know what to make of this Lexile range. Help me understand it. If a parent was given that addition of a reading level after a teacher sat with them as another data point to help them understand when you go to the library, these are some books that might be easier for your child or here pick a couple of books so your child is not frustrating. I want to offer that's not a bad thing. The challenge is when it's used to limit or when it's used as the instructional approach. So right. the, the most important information when talking to those teachers is, is that the only information right. that we're providing with parents? Right. Because that would be the challenge. So just having that is not necessarily bad news. The, the next question I would ask is, and what else? What are the multiple data points so that parents are really understanding? And the third point you make, both are true. Students can be making progress and can still have more progress to go and not be on grade level. And so we want to acknowledge and celebrate progress, but that's why we talk about acceleration because students that are that far behind can't afford to only make one year's growth in one year's time or we won't close that gap. 
Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up, and I know that I can only imagine what your front porch looks like, Miss Mac, because I would imagine it's just lined with people. Um, I started Saturday with a two-hour meeting with the teacher and ended Saturday night with another two-hour meeting I with the teacher. I have no doubt, and I think it is helpful for us because we continue to refine the ways, and we're certainly open to partner with any um, suggestions that you get along the way about how to make it more consistent because like I said our effort to have that slide and I know Dr. McComas is committed to partnering with Dr. Zarch and his chief of school so that whatever we put forward is consistent. Well I appreciate that and Mr. I think Ms. Causey had a question and then Mr. Thomas and then I have a follow-up question when we're finished. Yes thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, I <clears throat> I've been on the board since 2015, so I've you know been around and met with a lot of people and visited a lot of schools and seen a lot of things. So Lexile is different than Levels. And so Levels is the letters, right? It's A through yes. W well, it's or? A leveling system. So Lexile right. is also a leveling system of right. text. Right, um, but for the benchmark assessment system, it's the, the alphabet. now leveling system, yes. Um, and so one of the um, school visits that I had uh, was with an experienced principal and at an elementary school. And it's about um, balance and personalized instruction. So, um, and she was showing me um, the number of literacy engagement opportunities that they had for, um, for the students. And they used the benchmark assessment system through the Fontes and Pinnell in the beginning of the year with the oral reading um, to help see exactly where the students were. And then they used that as a piece of information, but they also had this incredible library system. Um, they did have the leveled reading room, so it had books for the students to come in select, but it also had the um, large number of books that the teachers could come in and they could as a resource center for them as they are you know, moving their children through the levels. Um, they also had a Ben Carson reading room. You know, I mean, they were like books all over the place. So that was something that seemed helpful. And then, you know, they came on to be one of the highest um, achieving schools, you know, doing better on the park when that was the thing year after year, incredible growth gains on that. Um, so the question is, the contract expired, but if there are uh, principals or teachers that are using this as a one point intervention are there consumables that they can still buy or do they how does that how does that work um the benchmark assessment system um it, it's not consumable the the books are um you know hard you know they're like cardboard kind of bound books and then the um teacher record keeping is um copyable photo we have photocopy permission for it so it's not a consumable resource OK, so every school has this resource. Every elementary school has this resource. Right. Mm -hmm. OK, and so if they're if if principals or part of their instructional leadership team are finding this as a useful tool, it's still available to them. Correct. Yep. OK, and that's why we made the distinction in the slide that no ELA office budget, because we did this initial sort of one time. So schools have what they need, um, but there's nothing um, consumable that they would need to do to continue to use it, as you described, as a beneficial tool in that larger compendium of resources for literacy. Right. And as far as from a parent's perspective, knowing where your child is reading, um, and, and this was encouraged at the school, is that the students were encouraged to get something on their level and then something above their level right and then anything else they wanted so if they liked yep. horses and yep. they're you know they might have been on level l but there were a lot of horse books at you know at d f and g then they would go and pick and what they want, they pick can, their level pick a little bit above and so they can sometimes parent, read a cue book about a horse because when you're interested and have that background knowledge you can really stretch sometimes that. right and so the parent knowing what this means could say okay yep. well if the child's reading, sitting right now, reading that higher level, let me sit beside them because there may be some decoding or, or vocabulary help there they'll need. So even uh, with Lexile, the same thing, that parents yep. can have that piece of information to be helpful. So to help support the children learning to love to read and and you know doing well at it. So thank you for this. This is great. Great. If Mr. I may Offerman. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Uh, Mr. Offerman. Yes, my question concerns new teachers coming to us. Uh, 
what, if anything, do, do, do we know about about uh, about about their use of all these tools? And uh, are we doing anything or planning anything to do special in terms of uh, in terms of training them? That's a great question, Mr. Offerman. Our new teacher training focuses specifically on curriculum. So we train new teachers in open court. Uh, we train them in the core resources of curriculum. If a school, so the school that Ms. Causey just described, that's a part of the school's culture that the principal has added that additional component. All of our reading specialists are trained to support new teachers in their building. Should that be an additional data point um, that the school is using to help round out that data story for an individual reader for the parent. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions, Mr. Offerman? None. OK, and Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So I don't I, I, this contract was procured in 2016, so obviously that was way past the time I was in elementary. What grade school. were you in then, Mr. Thomas? We keep missing you. <laughs> maybe sixth or seventh grade. I think I had just missed it, but I remember. What level did you read? <laughs> I don't remember, but right. I remember um there was we used to have color coded books that were like green, Same red, idea. yellow. Yeah, that and was, that's why I made the connection to Miss Causey. There's multiple leveling systems out there. So yeah. Lexile is one leveling system. Fontes and Pinnell. Some um, publishers use their own for their. Elastic core. has their own. Elastic has one. Okay. So yeah. there's multiple. Yeah, well, I just remember I used those from like from K to second grade, but then once I joined um, third grade, then we started splitting up into GT courses, and I, I know we no longer use that, and I was just reading whatever was in the course. So, yeah, so um, oftentimes, and that's what I referenced before. Even those that are um, you know very concerned about leveling admit that there's a moment in a reader's life, and third grade is the moment where we would assume, or the yeah. basic curriculum assumes that we've mastered the code, and now it's just a wide open um, you know, reading of, of lots of different things. The other thing I want to mention is while the Phonetically predictable decodable text is very good for instruction. Nobody fell in love with reading, reading the cat sat on a mat <laughs> mm -hmm. or cat sat on a hat. It's really important and it has a place, but they need that and they need picture book read alouds and they need, you know, need an opportunity because we also want them to just fall in love with reading. So yeah, and I remember those tests that we, we would have um, outside in the classroom. I kept I, I'm thinking of personal experience. I remember reading the books and not being interested and like waiting for my next time to have the test so that I can move up a reading level. And I remember I, I kept getting frustrated because I was like, this, these books are so easy and I don't know why the test, the, the verbal test that I took may, kept me at this level. So I just wanted to share that as well. Sure. Um, we're not approving a contract with this. This is just a presentation, correct? Correct. Right. This was okay. just answering some questions. Yep. Thank you. And so thank you all so much for presenting this for all the companies. Oh, Dr. McComas, go ahead. Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to add like a closing uh, when you're finished, Mr. Thomas. OK, yeah, so thank you for presenting this and explaining this. Um, and I would love to have a further conversation about structured literacy versus guided reading. I, I didn't know that that reading war. I don't know much about that. And I, I just kind of want to understand then, you know, where we are in in, in kind of course in, in comparison to some of the other districts and maybe in Maryland that might, might use guided reading instead of structured reading or around the country. Just to kind of, as we're doing our own research as board members, kind of get that distinction. We're structured uh, literacy, but sure. <laughs> I, I would like to ask one more question and I don't expect you to have an answer, but if you could put it out to the full committee. Um, I understand that we're trialing something called My View Literacy and which is more leveled reading, which I'm OK with from three to five, but K to two. Um, can you, can it's you not, take? Yeah, it's it's not leveled reading, so we can certainly with um, Dr. McComas, um, we can certainly schedule that as maybe a larger presentation, but it's actually a core curriculum. It's like we use uh, currently have wonders. So while um, pretty much every publisher has with it leveled materials that accompany it, just like Mr. Thomas talked about his color coded at one point, that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to be a core, um, actually language arts. It's not just reading, it actually includes writing as well. Yes, if that, that would be helpful. And Mr. Thomas, I'd like to tell you that I've been out of school for many, many years, but I use the SRA color coded <laughs> reading. Um, you started at yellow and ended at yes. purple. Um, so I just thought I'd point that out to you um, that old things come back around. <laughs> if, if, I, if I may, I just wanted to share an update because I know Dr. Perandozzi had to sign off. Um, my team was able to confirm that there are at least two teachers at Campfield Early Learning Center that have been trained in Orton Gillingham. So I know that was a question earlier, so I wanted to close that. Thank loop. you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Shea. 
Um, if this I is may, Ms. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. Really appreciate that. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Go ahead, um, Dr. McComas. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to clarify. I hope some misunderstandings around FNP, um, and I um, appreciate uh, the robust discussion to help everyone understand how um, oftentimes people inadvertently think it's this or that, and it's really the work is really about orchestrating a lot of resources to meet the specific needs of each individual learner, whatever that may be, rather that's needing the level of Orton-Gillingham support or um, being able to have a conversation with a mom about, you know what, your student is here and, and our next level, our next stretch skills look like this. And these are some opportunities for us to see them make progress because any leveled system, regardless of, of what the publisher is, it's really a sense of a ladder to give hope, right? To give that ability to really see, clearly see what that next level of skill and performance looks like um, in terms of reading. And so I know myself, I've had really good conversations when I was a principal with parents around uh, where their student was currently performing with the aspiration that we're stretching and getting to that next level and that next level. Uh, and I just want to say thank you again for holding both growth and proficiency together because it's not one or the other. Growth gives us the hope and the energy um, to believe that we can achieve proficiency. And so I just want to say uh, thank you again for the opportunity. I am very committed to um, supporting your understanding and our broader stakeholder understanding too. It's complex work, uh, but there's nothing uh, we would rather spend our, our life's energy in doing. So um, on that, I'll just have you close it out, Ms. Mack. And um, once again, you know, this is, I think, the, the best committee because it's committee. the core mission. So uh, well, I would like to say thank you for bringing this information because I specifically asked for it. Um, I found it very helpful and I'm sure Mr. Thomas will be following up with you to um, ask you know, further questions. Our next meeting is March 17th. And if there is no further business, our meeting is adjourned and everybody should go outside because it's 60 degrees and we should take advantage of that. So have a good evening and thank you again, everyone.